Good morning once again. Can I uh, have you turn with me in your Bibles to the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 24. Now, if you're new with us, we are working our way through 1 Samuel here at Calvary on Sunday morning. And the last few weeks we've been focusing on David because he becomes the central figure of the book in these later chapters. And uh, last time we saw David, he was running for his life from Saul. And he and his guys said, come down to the area of En Gedi. And Gedi is a, 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 an oasis in the desert, not far from the Dead Sea. So that's where they are. And we pick it up in verse 1 of chapter 24. Now what happened when Saul had returned from following the Philistines, that it was told him, saying, Take note, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. Then Saul took 3,000 cho chosen men from all Israel and went to seek David and his men on the rocks of the wild goats. So he came to the sheepfold by the road where there was a cave, and Saul went in to attend to his needs. David and his men were staying in the recesses of the cave. Now, I don't want to be indelicate, but wow. I mean, you know, to have your enemy in a position like this was just too good to be true. I mean, here, David, uh, here Saul is chasing David all over the wilderness to kill him. And he has to stop to use the bathroom, you know, what can you t say? And uh, he picks the very cave David and his guys are hiding in. I mean, if you wrote this into a movie, nobody would believe it, because it doesn't happen in real life, right? In fact, the situation was so over the top, tailor made for taking vengeance on their enemy, that David's men assumed that God had delivered Saul to them on a silver platter for them to kill him so David could take the throne. And so we pick it up in verse 4. Then the men of David said to him, This is the day of which the Lord said to you, Behold, I will deliver your enemy into your hand, that you may do to him, that you may do to him as it seems good to you. And David arose and secretly cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Now, guys, we don't read anywhere in 1 Samuel where God ever spoke these words to David. That someday he would deliver Saul to David's hands for David to take vengeance on. Apparently, and I kind of believe that this was another assumption on the part of David's men. Because apparently they interpreted God's promise to David that someday he would replace Saul as king over Israel. They interpreted that to mean that someday God would deliver Saul into David's hands for David to kill and then take the throne. And i got to admit, by the circumstances here, it seemed that that was exactly what God had done. I mean, because Saul is here going to the bathroom in the very cave where David and his men are hiding. I mean, it looked like a slam dunk, right? If you're David's guys, and they had God's promise someday David was going to be king of Israel, how are you going to do that if Saul's still around? We get perfect. God's going to deliver Saul into David's hand for him to kill. Look at this, just like God said, right? Assuming this is what God intended. In fact, it looked like such a slam dunk that this was, in fact, what God wanted David to do, that even David got caught up in the situation, and he, you know, in a momentary lapse of judgment, cuts off the corner of Saul's robe. Now, let me just stop here and say this. Just because a course of action seems like a no-brainer doesn't necessarily mean God is in it. I mean, look, if you're driving down a road, uh, you know, you're wanting to find a house and you've been looking and looking and all of a sudden you're driving down a road at the exact moment the realtor is putting a for sale sign in front of a house that you look at and at first glance it looks absolutely perfect. Right down to the white picket fence, the flower boxes under the windows. You might be prone to think, well, this is a sign from God and God wants me to now act quickly and make an offer on this deal before somebody else does, you know? You know, so often, guys, people make the assumption that something has to be God's will because the circumstances would never come together like this if God wasn't in it. And so because we often let, listen, our circumstances and emotion dictate our actions and not really take the time often to really pray it through, you know, in a very serious way, but we make a hasty decision and then down the road we find out we've made a big mistake. I mean, whether you're talking about buying a house or choosing a spouse, 
Sometimes emotions can lead us astray. In this situation, David's men got caught up in the emotion of the moment. Look, the passion or the emotion to take revenge on somebody who has hurt you or who is trying to hurt you and you've done nothing wrong to them. And suddenly a situation presents itself where you can take revenge on them in some way. It's easy if you're not really a spiritually minded person. It's easy to assume God has orchestrated the circumstance for you to do that very thing. Take revenge or vengeance upon them. And guys, for a second, that's exactly what David thought. Until he stopped himself and realized that God hadn't handed Saul over to him for him to take vengeance upon him, but God had handed Saul over to him so that, God, so that David could show mercy to him. And the idea was that after David caught himself, first of all thinking, well, yeah, I guess God has delivered Saul into my hand, but then David stopped as quickly as he thought that and thought to himself, wait a minute, that's not how God works. I don't believe God wants me to take vengeance upon Saul. I believe he wants me to show mercy to Saul. And the idea was that David believed that this would hopefully turn Saul's heart away from being an enemy to a friend. To a friend. I read years ago uh, a story about a Massachusetts congressman named Thaddeus Stevens who bitterly wished to crush the South at the end of the Civil War. The South, of course, of course, lost to the North. And Stevens bitterly wanted to crush the South. I mean, just really do them in after they lost the war, the South did. But he heard President Lincoln give a message about the need to bind up the nation's wounds, to forgive and to reconcile. We're one nation. We need to come together now. The Civil War has torn us apart for too many years. And as Lincoln was giving his address to these congressmen about the need for binding up the wounds of the nation, Stevens became so furious, he pounded his fist on the cabinet table and shouted, Mr. Lincoln, I think enemies ought to be destroyed. To which President Lincoln quietly responded, Mr. Stevens, do I not destroy my enemy when I make him my friend? And that seems to be the mindset that David is incorporating right here. Now, you need to understand, as I've said this before, let me say it again. Saul had turned against David. Saul was trying to kill David for no reason. David was truly being persecuted for righteousness sake. All he ever did was serve Saul with a right heart gave him everything he had because David was one of Saul's generals. So David only served Saul with all of his heart, never had done anything wrong to him, and Saul turned against David, became jealous of David, and now was trying to kill David. But David had always loved and respected Saul. In fact, David looked up to Saul, I'm convinced, as a hero figure. Because when Saul was a new king, you remember how that uh, at one point he was being hassled by demons because you know, he was living in rebellion against God and so you know, just demonic oppression came upon him. And uh, he sought for a musician that would come and play for him because he felt better when music was being played. And so they said, look, uh, David, the son of Jesse, is a fantastic musician, uh, excellent harpist. Uh, call for him. David was, what, 14 at the time? And so he comes in, and he's now Saul's personal musician. And every time David played the harp, uh, Saul felt better. And David, I'm sure, as a young guy, 14 years old, was looking at this, this man, Saul. And Saul, as we've already said, was uh, taller than anyone else in Israel, better looking than anyone else in Israel, was now king, had a real charisma about him that drew people to him. And I think David looked up to Saul as a kind of a hero figure. Not to mention the fact that David respected Saul with all of his heart because God had anointed. This is David's, the Lord's anointed. God had anointed Saul to be the first king of Israel. Therefore, guys, all of this fed into David's conviction about not taking judgment upon Saul when he had the chance. And we pick that up in verse 5. Now, what happened afterward that David's heart troubled him because he had cut Saul's robe. 
And he said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch out my hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. So David restrained his servants with these words and did not allow them to rise against Saul. And Saul got up from the cave and went on his way. Now, I have to stop and interject this because I've heard this before from a lot of word of faith people. And uh, they have claimed that this passage is proof that we should never challenge or criticize anyone who is a teacher of God's word. And, and they're thinking primarily of word of faith teachers, okay? Because they reason, look, they are God's anointed, and even as David refused to touch Saul because he was the Lord's anointed, therefore we must never touch the Lord's anointed, any word of faith teachers, uh, by challenging what they're teaching. It's the idea. Look, David didn't touch the Lord's anointed, but he did rebuke the Lord's anointed. Peter was definitely the Lord's anointed, right? And yet Paul rebuked him, not for heresy, but for hypocrisy and uh, conduct unbefitting a leader in the church. Why? Because Peter was in a certain area with Paul, and they were eating with the Gentiles, and had a lot of Gentiles that belonged to the church. In fact, that's what the church primarily was, outside of Jerusalem, was Gentile believers. So here's Peter, ministering with Paul, and uh, eating with the Gentiles, and so on. But then some big shots from Jerusalem came. Some of these uh, well-known people, uh, uh, Pharisees and all, they claimed to be Christians. And Peter withdrew from the Gentiles, refused to eat with them anymore, and only hung out with the Jewish big shots. And Paul, I said, Paul said, I withstood him to his face. And I basically rebuked him for hypocrisy. Peter, we couldn't even keep the law, okay, as Jews. And, uh, and God opened the door for us to be saved by grace, and now the Gentiles by grace. Who are you to respect, be a respecter of persons? God loves all of his people, and so on. So Paul took Peter to task. Look, Christian leaders are not infallible. They are not infallible. We are not infallible. And sometimes we need to be corrected. But listen to me, false teachers need to be challenged, exposed, and driven from the church. We've talked about this illustration, but I think it's very important that we understand this, that if unhealthy teachings enter into the body of Christ, it becomes the responsibility of all the members in that church body to mobilize and to purge the body of these teachings. Don't give any ear to it. Don't listen and uh, embrace the things. If you know, Just drive it from the church. Even as white blood cells in a human body, if a disease invades a human body, the white blood cells mobilize, attack that disease to drive it from the body. Any human body that becomes too weak for whatever reason to purge itself of the disease that has entered into it is going to grow weaker and weaker until it finally dies. The same is true with a church body. Turn to 1 John 4. I'll read you a couple of scriptures along these lines. You know them, I'm sure. But these are just a sampling of many verses we could look at about testing the teachings that come into the church and the teachers that bring them. In 1 John 4, verse 1, John the Apostle says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God. For many false prophets, many false teachers is the idea, have gone out into the world. Don't believe every spirit. Just because something sounds spiritual doesn't mean it's from the Holy Spirit. It could be from a demonic spirit who lie, these de demons, right? He says, so therefore, test the spirits. Now the question is, where do you get a spirit tester? <laughs> Hobby Lobby, Menards, I don't know. They sell different kinds of testers, but a spirit tester. Well, you have one on your lap, of course. It's the Word of God. And John is saying that, look, you can't trust every teacher that claims to represent God, that they really are from God and are teaching what God wants. So therefore, whatever, whenever you listen to a, a pastor or a teacher, make sure you, you compare what they're saying to God's Word. If it doesn't line up, reject it. 
reject it. It's not from God. God never contradicts himself. Okay, if a man's teaching something contrary to what God said in his word, obviously that man is, or woman is not speaking on behalf of God. In Acts chapter 17, verse 11, Paul had preached the gospel in Thessalonica. And the Holy Spirit commended them because the folks in Thessalonica were open-minded. I mean, being open-minded to God's word is very important. You have to be careful that you're not open-minded to everything. I mean, there are some people who are so open-minded, I think their brains have fallen out. You've got to be careful, all right, with that. But Paul was down in Thessalonica ministering the gospel and teaching the word. And the Holy Spirit commended the Thessalonians because they received it with an open heart. Then Paul goes down to Berea, the next town south of there, and he preaches to the Bereans. And the Holy Spirit says they were also noble in that they received the word of God with an open heart, but they took it a step farther. They went home and made sure everything Paul spoke was in line with the scriptures. And the Holy Spirit commended them. And that was the great apostle Paul they were challenging. And they were, you know, comparing his teaching to the word of God. This is not something that is divisive or wrong, even though people are telling us this. Anytime a Christian today, in these last days, full of deception, anytime a Christian today wants to challenge a teaching, and the teacher that has brought it into the church because it's not lining up with the Word of God, they become the problem. The church often ostracizes them as divisive and unloving. And we hear their cry. Just taken from this passage here. We hear their cry from those wanting to protect their leaders from correction, touch not the Lord's anointed. Remember David? He didn't touch Saul when he had the opportunity. Therefore, we are not to touch God's anointed. First of all, uh, how do you know this guy is, or this gal is anointed by God to teach the word if, he's, if they're teaching something contrary to the word of God? And they're not anointed then. So right away you're assuming because they're saying thus says the Lord or they're teaching the Bible that they're teaching it accurately and that God has anointed them to be teachers of his word. Again, compare what they're saying to what God has said. It's true. David didn't touch the Lord's anointed physically, but he did rebuke the Lord's anointed verbally. Verse 7, once again, so David restrained his servants with these words and did not allow them to rise against Saul. And Saul got up from the cave and went on his way. David also arose after a word, went out of the cave and called out to Saul, saying, this must have been an awkward moment, okay, my lord the king. And when Saul looked behind him, David stooped with his face to the earth and bowed down. And David said to Saul, Why do you listen to the words of men who say, Indeed, David seeks your harm? Look, this day your eyes have seen that the Lord delivered you today into my hand in the cave, and someone urged me to kill you, but my eye spared you. And I said, I will not stretch out my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. Moreover, my father, see, yes, see the corner of your robe in my hand. For in that I cut off the corner of your robe and did not kill you. No, and see that there is neither evil nor rebellion in my hand, and I have not sinned against you. Yet you hunt my life to take it. Let the Lord judge between you and me, and let the Lord avenge me on you, but my hand shall not be against you. As the proverb of the ancients says, wickedness proceeds from the wicked, but my hand shall not be against you. After whom has the king of Israel come out? Whom do you pursue, a dead dog, a flea? Who am I that you should pursue me? I'm nobody. Therefore, let the Lord judge and, and uh, judge between you and me and see and plead my case and deliver me out of your hand. In verse 13, David quotes an ancient proverb that not only happens to be true, but is very New Testament from a doctrinal point of view. He said, wickedness proceeds from the wicked. Now, we could modify that statement slightly and say it with the same degree of accuracy by stating it this way, sin proceeds from the sinner. I hope you realize that sinning does not make you a sinner. It just proves that you are one. 
My pastor used to like to say, stealing a horse doesn't make you a horse thief. It only proves that you are one. Because if you were not a horse thief, you could never steal a horse, right? The actions don't make you what you are. They simply reveal what you are. The fruit of what you're doing, or the actions are the fruit uh, of your nature, whatever your nature is, right? When I said this proverb that David quoted was very New Testament, I had something Jesus himself said in mind. Turn to Matthew 7. I think most of you know where I'm going. Matthew 7, starting in verse 15. Jesus said, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles or weeds? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you will know them. And here Jesus, as he often did, gives a simple illustration from nature to prove his point. And that is that no one expects to pick, to pick grapes from a thorn bush or figs from thistles. Why? Well, very simply because those things are not capable of bringing forth good fruit. And the idea behind good fruit is that which is nourishing and beneficial for life. Only God can bring forth life. Fruit has life in it. Okay, the seeds within that fruit, you can plant and grow a new, some more of that same fruit, right? The idea is that only God can bring forth life, and fruit has within it life. The flesh can bring forth works of the flesh, as Paul talked about in Galatians 5. The works of the flesh are these, and he lists a whole bunch of things. But the fruit of the Spirit are these, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. He says, no human being can produce these things. It has to come from God because the fruit of the Spirit comes only from God's nature. Only from God's nature, okay? And therefore, what Jesus is saying is that, uh, that everything is going to bring forth after its kind. Thorns proceed from thorn bushes, just like sin proceeds from sinners. And that's why Jesus said, you will know them by their fruit. Look, the Bible says that anyone who has Jesus Christ living in their hearts by faith, is, who doesn't have Jesus living in their hearts by faith, is a sinner by nature. A sinner by nature. It makes no difference, guys, that they consider themselves a Christian or they call themselves a Christian. Um, that doesn't make any difference, okay? Because the label doesn't change what they are by nature. For example, I can hang a sign around a thorn bush that says apple tree on it. But you're not going to be able to pick apples from the thing, right? The same way as with somebody who walks around with a Jesus t-shirt on a Christian t-shirt. Well, that doesn't mean the fruit of the Spirit is going to start growing from their life. Everything will bring forth after its kind. We have to understand this, that we are born into this world as human beings. We are all born of Adam. Adam blew it for all of us in the Garden of Eden. When Adam uh, ate the forbidden fruit and fell, all of his descendants have been born fallen sinners. Sinners by nature, right? And there's no way we can change that. Oh, sure, people can come to church and act like Christians because they think maybe they are Christians. You can, you can manufacture artificial fruit, right? I don't know if you've seen any artificial fruit lately. They've come a long way with artificial fruit in the last few years. I remember years ago, I was in a store somewhere and I had a little bowl of artificial fruit and it looked gross. It looked artificial. Today you look in some stores and they have some artificial fruit laying around. It looks like it's real, right? Some people are very good at counterfeiting God's fruit. They don't really have Jesus in their heart, but they go to church and they know in, in church they're supposed to act a certain way. They're supposed to act like they love people. They're supposed to act like they're righteous and pure and holy. But God knows the heart, right? 
It's not until we give our hearts to Jesus Christ, inviting Him to come into our heart as Lord and Savior of our life, that God gives to us a new nature. This is what it means to be born again. We were born the first time in Adam, fallen sinners by nature. We're born the second time as people who have received Jesus Christ, and the life of God has now come inside of us, and we are, as Peter said, given a new nature, the nature of God. We are no longer sinners by nature now. We are children of God by nature. But we have to be careful, guys. We have to be careful because that doesn't mean that we can't still sin. Now, hang on to that thought for a minute because I want to back up to something I forgot to mention. Again, everything's going to bring forth after its kind. And... Um, we have to understand that regardless of what a person verbally professes about themselves, the fruit in their life, whatever comes out of their life, will ultimately be the, the um, uh, ultimate revealer. Uh, in the end, it will be the ultimate re revealer of what's really going on in their hearts, what their nature is, right? Remember what Paul said to Titus? He said, there are many who profess to know God, but in works they deny Him. So a lot of people that profess to be Christians, but their lives don't reflect that. Oh yeah, they come to church and they, you know, sing this, the songs and they maybe give a little money uh, to the work of God and so on and so forth. But when they leave this place, no, I'm not saying this place specifically, but in general, when they leave church, they go into the world and they're still lying and cheating and fornicating and stealing and everything else, but then they're back in church on Sunday morning. Now, they might have deceived themselves into thinking they're tr true Christians. But the Bible says very clearly, as Paul said to Titus, they profess to know God, but by their lifestyle, they deny Him. Or as John said in his first epistle, turn to 1 John 3. I think John nails it here. It's exactly what we're talking about. 1 John 3. Starting with verse 7. John says, Dear children, don't let anyone deceive you about this. Okay, don't let anybody tell you differently. Here it is. Here's the truth. When people do what is right, or when they act righteously, it shows that they are righteous, even as Christ is righteous. But when people keep on sinning, and the idea is sinning habitually, it shows that they belong to the devil who has been sinning since the beginning. But the Son of God came to destroy the works of the devil. Those who have been born into God's family do not make a practice of sinning, because God's life is in them. Yes, His very nature. So they can't keep on living habitually in sin, is the idea, because they are now children of God. Now look, that's not to say that an unbeliever can't do something good once in a while, nor is it to say that a believer can't do something bad once in a while. John is simply laying out the general pattern of each of their lives. When a person becomes a Christian, as I just said earlier, they are no longer a sinner by nature. Now they are a child of God by nature. That doesn't mean they're never going to sin again. It just means that they are a new creation and have gone by nature from sinner to saint. A saint would be somebody set apart from the world with God's nature inside of them, right? And that new nature, guys, when you are really born again, the Spirit of God comes in you, gives you the nature of God, and now because God is in you, you have the ability to, to you know, the Spirit has the ability to produce through you the, the uh, uh, fruit of the Spirit, which is really, it's God's nature coming through. And Paul said in Philippians 1 verse, uh, 1 verse 11 that when a person gets born again, they begin to produce the fruits of righteousness, which is the evidence that they really know the Lord. And so guys, that brings us to the converse or flip side of our proverb. If wickedness proceeds from the wicked, then guess what? Righteousness proceeds from the righteous. Aren't you glad you have me here to explain these things? <laughs> Look, this righteousness, of course, only comes through Christians because only Christians are righteous in the sense that Jesus Christ has washed them of their sins, given them a new nature, and they are born again of the Spirit. This righteousness that proceeds from the Christian can take on many different forms. 
And we could spend weeks talking about these. I think you understand, though. Uh, you could be talking about uh, the, the, they now obey, obey God's commandments. They have a desire to evangelize the lost. They want to help the poor. They even want to love their enemies. Okay, these are all the fruits of righteousness that begin to manifest in a person's life that has given their hearts to Christ. However, in looking at our text this morning, I want to quickly draw out the one thing that was most evident in David's life. Who was a righteous man, not a perfect man, but a righteous man. He was a believer, right? Look at verse 12 again. David said to Saul, let the Lord judge between you and me, and let, listen, the Lord avenge me on you, but my hand shall not be against you. Many years later, Paul the Apostle would kind of uh, elaborate on this. And maybe Paul had this very verse in mind, 1 Samuel 24, 12, when the Spirit led him to kind of expand that idea in Romans 12, starting with verse 18. You can turn there. Because I think Paul had this in mind as he spoke these words in Romans 12, starting with verse 18 where he said, Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scriptures say, I will take revenge. I will pay them back, says the Lord. Instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals of shame on their heads. Keep that in mind. We'll come back to it. He said, don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. Look, let's not misunderstand David. David was an Old Testament king, not a New Testament Christian. And he did take vengeance on the Philistines many times, but only because they were the enemies of God. They were the enemies of God. When it came to his own personal enemies, we see David's heart expressed in how he treated them in Psalm 109. So please turn there. In Psalm 109, starting with verse 1, David is crying out to God in prayer. He said, Do not keep silent, O God, of my praise. For the mouth of the wicked and the mouth of the deceitful have opened against me. They have spoken against me with a lying tongue. They have also surrounded me with words of hatred and fought against me without a cause. In return for my love, they are my accusers. But I give myself to prayer. Thus they have rewarded me evil for good and hatred for my love. Look, David was grieved, as we all would be. David was grieved over the evil others had done to him in response to all the good he had shown them. But his response was to pray for them, to keep loving them and treating them kindly, and then to bring everything to God and leave it at God's feet. Where David said, look, I'm not happy that people have turned against me that I've loved and tried to be good to, but I'm not going to take vengeance on them. I'm going to pray for them. I'm going to still do good to them. And I'm going to bring the whole thing to God and say, God, I'll let you deal with them as you see fit. But David didn't seek to bring vengeance upon them for what they had done to him. Turn to Psalm 35. Listen to what David says in Psalm 35, starting with verse 11. He said, Fierce witnesses rise up. They ask me things that I do not know. They reward me evil for good to the sorrow of my soul. But as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled myself with fasting, and my prayer would return to my own heart. I paced about as though he were my friend or brother. I bowed down heavily as one who mourns for his mother. So, you know, when they were sick, man, I prayed for him like I was praying for my own brothers or my own mother. But when I was, you know, afflicted, I bowed down heavily as one who mourns for his mother. Verse 15. But in my adversity, they rejoiced. 
and gathered together attackers gathered against me, and I did not know it. They tore at me and did not cease. With ungodly mockers at feast, they gnashed at me with their teeth, you know. So they're having a party, they're getting together, you know, and I'm the topic of the conversation. It's, get, it's gotten back to me that, you know, as they're, they're feasting together, they're ripping me to shreds. I've done nothing wrong to them. He said, verse 17, or verse 16, with ungodly mockers at feast, they gnashed at me with their teeth. Verse 17, Lord, how long will you look on? Rescue me from their destruction, my precious life from the lions, or in other words, from those who want to tear me to pieces. Look, once again, David refused to take vengeance upon his enemies, but rather looked to God to deal with them as he saw fit. In that regard, guys, David was acting very much like the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, David was not like Jesus in a lot of ways, in different circumstances. But here, in the way he treats Saul, I do see him representing, of course, Jesus would come much later down the road, but I, I do believe that he was treating Saul the same way that Jesus treated his enemies. You don't have to turn to it, but 1 Peter 2, verse 23, speaking of Jesus, who when he was reviled, did not revile in return, when he suffered at the hands of enemies that he only loved and did kind things for, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him, to the Father who judges righteously. And again, guys, the words of Paul seem applicable here. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. And it does seem, at least for a while, that David's kindness towards Saul did, quote-unquote, conquer the evil that Saul sought to do to him. As David now shows Saul, I could have killed you, but I didn't because you're the Lord's anointed. I love and respect you. Why do you listen to the people that tell you I'm out to get you? I could have killed you. Here's the corner of your robe. I was encouraged by my guys to finish you off. But I want you to know, Saul, that I have never harbored evil in my heart toward you. Well, this broke Saul, at least for a while. And he makes a phenomenal confession. Verse 16. So it was when David had finished speaking these words to Saul that Saul said, Is this your voice, my son David? And Saul lifted up his voice and wept. Then he said to David, You are more righteous than I. For you have rewarded me with good, whereas I have rewarded you with evil. You And you have shown this day how you have dealt well with me. For when the Lord delivered me into your hand, you did not kill me. For if a man finds his enemy, will he let him get away safely? Therefore may the Lord reward you with good for what you have done to me this day. So Saul makes an honest confession. He told David, look... You're more righteous than I am. Because all I wanted to do was kill you. Basically admitting David had done nothing wrong to him. And Saul was returning uh, for David's good. Saul was returning evil. And Saul says, but you're more righteous than me. Because here I've been trying to kill you. And when you had the chance to finish me off, you didn't do it. You didn't do it. In that regard, David, you are more, you have rewarded, um, you have rewarded me with good, whereas I tried to do evil to you. Look, we've said it before, let me say it again. Returning good for evil, that's godly. So when somebody treats you in an evil way, but you return good to them, that's godly. Returning good for good or evil for evil, that's human. Any one of us can do that, right? We can, we can do nice things for those who are nice to us, and we can retaliate and do hurtful things to those who hurt us. That's just human. But returning evil for good, when somebody does you good and you return evil for that, that's demonic. And guys, look, I believe at very least, Saul here is suffering from a mental breakdown. The guy's a basket case, you know? I mean, he's one minute, uh, he's furious the next minute he's crying one minute i'm gonna kill you the next minute you're more righteous than me the guy was all over the map emotionally speaking and i do believe at very least he is suffering from a mental breakdown but at worst he could be demon possessed you say well was saul even saved i don't know i don't know we'll look at that a little more closely when we get to his death but i don't know if saul was saved um he sure didn't act like a guy who was saved 
But either way, Saul's confession may have been sincere at the moment. I do believe Saul at this moment was being sincere. Just like a lot of people who, in a moment of raw self-examination, can admit, yeah, I've done some pretty terrible things in my life. I've hurt a lot of people. The problem is, it is often momentary remorse and not genuine repentance. Remorse is simply feeling bad for what I've done and maybe even acknowledging that I've done wrong. Remorse takes it to the next level and actually then changes or uh, corrects behavior so that you're not doing the wrong things you had been doing. So it's one thing for a person to say, you know what, uh, I've been a pretty terrible husband or father or this or that. I've done some pretty bad things in my life. You think, well, that's good that they're acknowledging their sin. Well, that is good, but a lot of people just leave it there. They don't take it to the next step and repent, which is to turn around, stop doing what you're doing, start doing what's right. See, remorse and regret makes me feel good about myself. Oh, I'm not such a bad guy. I admitted I have done some pretty bad things in my life. God doesn't care about our self-esteem, okay? God's not interested in me building myself up by acknowledging, okay, well, I'm not perfect. I've done some pretty terrible things. Great. Now you want to come to Jesus so that you can repent of those sins and invite him into your heart as Lord and Savior where he gives you a new nature. Look, Saul's confession, guys, was nothing more than momentary remorse and not real repentance. How do I know that? Because in chapter 26, he's back at it again, chasing David to kill him. You know, Alan Redpath said something. Alan Redpath was a phenomenal man of God. He said, and I quote, talking about this very section in 1 Samuel 24, if a man is, is emotionally upset, as Saul was, and awakens to his condition, but only weeps about it, and still doesn't obey God, his second state is a thousand times worse than the first. Emotion that does not lead to action, repentance, only leads, uh, only leads deeper into sin and rebellion, end quote. Now, I don't have time to take you there or to explain it, but you can read Matthew 12, verses 43 to 45. I personally believe Redpath had that scripture in mind when he wrote that. So look, we're just about done. First Saul makes an honest confession, then he, he makes a remarkable admission. Verse 20, And now I know indeed that you shall surely be king, and that the kingdom of Israel shall be established in your hand. Therefore swear now to me by the Lord that you will not cut off my descendants after me and that you will not destroy my name from my father's house. So David swore to Saul and Saul went home. But David and his men went up to the stronghold. In other words, they're back to their hiding place because Saul's a nut job and he could turn at any minute and come after us again, which he does. Okay. <laughs> But after Saul acknowledges that David is going to definitely one day be king, he asked David to promise him that, look, when you're king, please don't kill my descendants. This was a common practice in those days. If a man was king and then somebody overthrew him, a man from a different family, obviously, it was customary for that new king to wipe out immediately all the descendants of the prior king because that would remove any competition for the throne, right? And so Saul is acknowledging that was the practice. Saul would have done that if there was a king that he had taken over for. But he says, look, I know you're going to be king someday, David. Listen, when you're king, will you promise me you won't kill my descendants? And David graciously uh, consents to that, agrees to that, uh, that uh, promise. Um, and we see his kindness... Uh, eventually shown to Jonathan's crippled son Mephibosheth as David adopts Mephibosheth as his own son in 2 Samuel chapter 9. You can read about that. But guys, listen, once again, and here's where we get it, where we really apply this to us this morning, okay? Wickedness proceeds from the wicked and righteousness proceeds from the righteous, or as Jesus put it, by their fruits, you will know them. Now here's the thing. God wants us to make his name known in this world. God wants us to be lights in the darkness, right? Turn to Matthew 5. In essence, as children of God, God wants us 
to represent him to this world in the right way. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 5, starting in verse 43. He's talking to his disciples and says, You have heard the law that, that it says, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Now that's human, okay? That's human, all right? You don't have to be a Christian to love your neighbor, the one who lives close to you and is good to you. You don't have to be a Christian to hate your enemy, uh, that kind of thing, because that's just worldliness, okay? But I say to you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you, and in, in that way you will be acting as true children of your Father in heaven. For he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good, and sends rain upon the just and the unjust alike. For if you only love those who love you, what reward is that? That doesn't take a Christian, right? Even corrupt tax collectors can do that much. Back up to verse 16. Let your light so shine before men. And this is really, as Jesus went on to then explain, how do we let our light shine before men? And he goes on to talk about, uh, you know, uh, loving your enemies. But it, it goes back to this statement here. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Guys, one of the greatest ways that I know of today in these dark, evil days we're living in, one of the greatest ways that I know of to let your light shine in this world for Jesus is by showing kindness to those who hate you or who have set themselves as enemies against you. Now, I'll warn you, it's going to take the Holy Spirit giving you the grace and power to do that. It's not in us to love our enemies. That has to come from God. That's the fruit of the new nature. God is inside of us, and now we have the ability, only from God, to be able to bring forth the fruit of the Spirit. And the first one listed is what? Love. Agape love. God's love. We can't manufacture God's love. We can't fake it or make it. it Romans 5.5, 5, it has to be poured into us by the Holy Spirit. It is the moment we accept Christ as Lord and Savior. And so the greatest way, I think, to let your light shine in this evil world is to show kindness to those who hate you and are trying to persecute you. The first kindness you show them is you pray for them. How can I love my enemies? I have no feelings for them at all. Positive feelings. Well, God says, obey, and the feelings will come. We never let the feelings come first, and then we obey. We always obey what God has said, and then feelings will follow. I tell you this, you pick out somebody in your life that's hassling you at work or wherever else, you pick out somebody that right now has set themselves as an enemy against you, and you make them your spiritual project. And the first thing you do is you pray for them, because I'll, I'll warn you, you cannot hate somebody you're praying for. You are investing your life in them, and when you invest your life in somebody, I don't care who they are, you're going to start being connected to them in some way. You cannot pray consistently for somebody that hates you and you keep hating them. It just won't happen. So you pray for them. I want you to understand this, and we'll close. There's a lot of pain that people are harboring in their hearts. A lot of... You see them uh, and from an outward perspective. They're rude. They're crude. They're base. They're, they're always putting you down or mocking your Christianity. And it's easy in the flesh to want to retaliate, isn't it? To want to then begin to put them down, begin to retaliate against them, the very thing we're talking about not doing. What we need to do, first of all, and I think prayer is one of the things that will help us to do this, as we pray for them, God begins to work in our hearts, and begins, God begins to show us, you know what, have you ever wondered why they're so against you as a Christian? Don't you realize that this person has got a lot of hurt inside of them? Maybe they've lost somebody very dear to them, somebody they deeply loved, and now they're blaming God. But they can't hurt God, so what do they do? They lash out against you as a Christian because you represent God. You belong to God. We need to understand that a lot of the persecution that we experience from unbelievers 
is rooted in a lot of hurt and pain. May God give us the grace to look past the exterior and see a little bit into the heart. Because when we do, we're going to have compassion, right? When we do, we're not going to want to, you know, return evil for or good, uh, evil for their evil. We're going to want to show them love and kindness in spite of what they do to us. This will cause our light to shine. And as Paul said in Romans chapter 12, he says, look, he said, don't be overcome by evil, overcome evil with good. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, give him something to eat. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of shame upon his head. And the idea is that, look, in those days, if a person set themselves against somebody, it was, you know, looked at them as an enemy, but that person showed kindness back to this person. At one point, the kindness would often wear them down, and they would walk through the center of a town with a, a pan of burning coals on their head as a symbol of repentance and shame that they had misjudged this person and no longer want to be their enemy, but now want to be their, their friend. Paul is saying, look, don't give evil for evil. He says, give good for evil, because then you prove your children of God. And you will conquer over their evil by doing what's good. And in the process, win them to Christ. Where they will become a brother or a sister. And uh, no longer an enemy. i just warn you again, you know, you, some of you might be sitting there thinking, this guy's off his rocker. I am never going to treat my enemies with kindness. Can I ask you then, do you really know Jesus? Do you really know Jesus? Because if you really know Jesus, I'm not saying you're going to jump up and down and say, hippie, you know, yippee, uh, hooray, and uh, yeah, I'm going to run around and love my enemies. But if you know Jesus, you're going to start praying, Lord, I know this is right. Your word says it's true. Give me grace to love my, and that's what it takes, God's grace. And when we don't seek to avenge ourselves, the title of this message is, Vengeance Belongs to God. Our response, love our enemies. Pray for them. Reach out to them with kindness. And hopefully God will cause them to stop being an enemy and become a brother or sister in Christ. May God give us grace to do that. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We know that David was not a perfect man. We are not perfect people. But Lord, there were times when David just shone. And I think this is one of those times. Uh, Lord, give us the grace to be like David, but mostly to be like Jesus, of course, whereby, Lord, we truly try to show kindness to our enemies. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, your word says. Uh, you know, we don't fight against people. We fight against the forces of wickedness in the spirit realm who are pushing buttons in people's lives to attack us and persecute us. But Lord, they are pawns in Satan's hands. They are helpless uh, people that he has uh, taken captive to do his will. We must not hate them. We must pray for them. They would be released from their captivity by receiving Christ as Lord and Savior. So Lord, give us grace to see past the rough exterior to a heart that might be hurting desperately, that we have compassion on them and reach out to them with love and kindness. Father, we thank you. We ask all this now in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. There are no accidents in God's kingdom. Whoever you are this morning, you were supposed to be here because God wanted you to hear the message today. And so I would encourage you to take it to heart. Um, I'm sure we got many in this room. We've got, we've got problems with somebody at work or someplace, family. And God wants you to see them as your spiritual project, not somebody to oppose and retaliate against. And if you're a person here who is just first time, and we've talked about receiving Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and maybe you're not sure if you've ever done that. Please come on up here so we can pray with you and explain to you what that really means. And um, the rest of you guys, may God give you a blessed week. May He fill you with His Spirit and use you for His glory. God bless you guys. Have a great week.